Thank you, Jeanette. You may be seated. So I, I made an assumption earlier that you all know who Alexa is. How many don't know who Alexa is? Okay, you're all pretty, except for Jeanette. Everybody else knows who <laughs> Alexa is. Yeah, we just got that. Uh, Alexa, by the way, is the Google version of Siri uh, with Apple. And uh, so there's this woman that lives in our house now that is listening to everything we say, and it's kind of weird and kind of creepy. Yesterday I was studying out in the screen room. Sherry was in the kitchen cooking, and I kept hearing her say, Alexa, put on Chris Tomlin. Alexa, Lauren Daigle. Alexa, 60s rock and roll. And Alexa was apparently not paying attention because Sherry kept scolding her. You know, she's just not doing what she's supposed to be doing. So that's uh, technology. Usually I'm six years behind technology, so that's kind of weird that I knew that. So uh, it's good to see you all this morning. And today we're continuing our series of studies in Colossians. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And today the title of the message is Only Shadows. So there's a story of a nomad who was wandering through the Arabian desert. And that night, after a long, hot day on his camel, he pitched his tent and he lit a candle, feeling very, very hungry. He reached into his bag and pulled out a date. He opened up the date and it was literally filled with worms. Tossed it aside. Grabbed another date, opened it up, same thing, wormy. Tossed it aside. A third date, he picked up, opened it up. Again, it was filled with worms, and he tossed it aside. And so finally, he wondered, still feeling very hungry, what am I to do? So he came up with a plan. Whereupon, he blew out the candle and ate the fourth date. <laughs> Hiding from reality doesn't change reality. Truth does not vanish when it turns dark, but persists in spite of darkness. We can't hide from reality in the shadows or in the darkness. Former Vice President Walter Mondale described Washington, D.C., which is the political capital of the world and surrounded by poverty and violence, he described it this way, 67 square miles surrounded by reality. Now, we all saw that in the last couple of weeks. I mean, usually Washington, D.C. is like this shiny new nickel, right? It's all buffed and polished, and it looks great, and it's fantastic, but when those rioting took place in the Capitol, we realized that it's reality. Everything's not bright and shiny and clear and new, but there's reality all around us. Now, is reality is something we have to face. Sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's bad. Now, the Apostle Paul was writing this letter to the church at Colossae, and he was concerned, probably from what he heard from his friend Epaphras, that this group of baby Christians were drifting into the shadows rather than living in the light. I think we'd all agree that sometimes the shadows fool us into thinking they're reality. So I, I found this beautiful little YouTube uh, of a, a little two-year-old girl. And I asked Charlie if we could throw it up this morning, but it was too late, so we couldn't do that. But uh, you can look it up on YouTube. Just put a little girl uh, afraid of her shadow. And it shows this little toddler, and she's walking around. She notices her shadow, and so she starts running and crying. And then she stops, and the shadow's right in front of her, and she falls back, and she's totally scared of the shadow. How many times do we find ourselves like that? We're afraid of the shadows, the whispers, that this is the real thing when it's really not. We're afraid of the, the bad guy or the fresh date, but it's just not a reality. So what was the shadow, this image that kept the Colossians from reality? Well, if you have your Bibles or your, um, your phones, whatever you use, your tablets, turn to Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at four verses there, Colossians 2, 16 through 19. And here... Uh, Paul describes 
what the shadows are and what the reality is. This is the word of God for the people of God at Grace Community Church. Colossians 2, 16 through 19 in the New Living Translation. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies on Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they've had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body, for he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes. Now, the Colossian church had been infiltrated by other isms, Gnosticism, philosophies, and religions. And all of them said the same thing. Jesus is not enough. There's got to be more. They believed that Jesus plus something equals everything. Jesus plus astrology. Jesus plus the worship of angels. Or asceticism. Asceticism is the adherence to a strict set of behaviors or a code of conduct. All of these things were Jesus plus something. They wanted to put God in a box. They wanted to contain him. They wanted to say, okay, if we do these 10 things, these 20 things, and if we don't do these things, we're going to be okay with this God in a box. Jesus plus rules and regulation, neat and tidy, all set, good to go. Paul says, you're worshiping a shadow. It's not the real thing. You're worshiping a what instead of a who. You're worshiping a thing instead of the reality of Jesus. You see, the thing about making your religion a thing is you end up worshiping that thing. You end up on focusing on what you do or you don't do, and you miss out on God. So there was these um, children, um, and all of a sudden they started talking about their churches, and the denominations to which they belonged. And so one little boy said, well, I, I'm a Methodist. I, I go to a Methodist church. And another boy said, well, I'm, I'm a Southern Baptist. I, I go to a Southern Baptist church. And another said, well, I'm, I, I go to a covenant church. I'm a, a covenanter. And they looked at the fourth child and they said, well, what abomination do you belong to? <laughs> Sometimes we forget the denominations basically are Jesus plus something, right? Jesus plus baptism. Baptism the right way, by immersion, by pouring, by touching. Baptism the right way. Jesus plus speaking in tongues. Jesus plus some kind of uh, 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 communion, whether the wine and the bread are really Jesus' body and blood or they're not. Uh, they're some kind of a political viewpoint. There's Jesus plus something. And Paul's great theme of freedom in Christ was getting lost in the religion of the day. Galatians 5.1 says it this way. It is for, and listen to this, please. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Jesus is enough. You don't have to add anything to him. Now that is the Magna Carta of Christian liberty, Galatians 5.1. So what Paul is saying is that this shadow is a false religion. It's legalism. It's works righteousness. It's performance-ism. It's not real, he says. It's a thing. It's a shadow. And that shadow often keeps us from the real thing. Anyone can believe the right things for a short behavior short period of time. Anyone can behave properly for a short period of time. But Paul says that's only a shadow. That's only a shadow. The reality is Jesus Christ, his grace, and his salvation. Now, this has been an age-old heresy. 
I don't need God. I can do it myself. If I just try harder, if I'm just a little bit more religious, if I just, if I'm circumcised, if I worship angels, if I speak in tongues, if I read the Bible over an hour a day, if I do all of it, then I will be okay. In other words, we have really set ourselves up when we have this system of asceticism, this system of this is what I need to do to please God. We're setting ourselves up as God, really. So take a look at this uh, cartoon. I love this cartoon. What it says there is the primary reason that cats will never develop a system of organized religion. (laughs) Too many human beings are just like this. I don't need you to tell me what I should do. I don't need God telling me how I should live. I, I, I already know how I should live. I mean, this is an age of complete independence where we believe, in fact, that's what the millennials really believe this, that no matter what you believe, it's okay as long as you believe something, right? That Jesus is not enough. There's got to be something more. There's got to be a, a higher power. There's got to be a greater thing. There's got to be nothing. There's got to be something. But the Bible tells us and our, our text tells us that Jesus is enough. He's sufficient, he's preeminent, he's supreme. You need not add anything else. And for all the years that are recorded in the scriptures, people have been trying to prove themselves to God. Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, you know that story. So these people started building this tower for two reasons. One reason, to show how great they are. It's like the Sears Tower of 6000 BC, right? It's just, they're going to build this tower to people see how great we are. And the other reason is, we think we can just get closer to God. The higher we go, the closer we get to God. And so you're climbing and climbing and you're trying and putting in effort trying to get to God. That is always religion. Religion is always about trying to reach God. Christianity is always about God reaching down to man. It's a completely different thing. It's a shadow versus the reality of Jesus. Lewis Johnson, former professor, Dallas Seminary, said it this way. One of the most serious problems facing the Orthodox Christian Church today is the problem of legalism. One of the most serious problems facing the church in Paul's day was legalism. In every age, it is the same. Legalism wrenches the joy of the Lord from the Christian believer. Nothing is left but cramped, somber, dull, and listless profession. The Christian under the law is a miserable shadow of the real thing. So I grew up in a church, uh, a small community church. Uh, It wasn't a denominational church, but the pastor was. The pastor was uh, Nazarene, uh, which is a a very fine denomination. But in those days, the 60s, it was really legalistic, Uh, just like this little church was really legalistic. I remember Pastor Woodhouse. He's gone to be with the Lord now. I remember him preaching always against something, Instead of preaching about Jesus and the grace that he provides and the forgiveness he provides, he was always preaching against something. You know, I I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls who do. He was preaching against smoking and dancing and card playing, all the things that I wanted to do as a 15-year-old, right? And And the thing that was his favorite thing was preaching against drinking. Now, back in the 60s, you'll remember some of you, Drinking was not a pretty common thing in most evangelical homes. It is today, but it wasn't back then. And he would just wail away at preaching against drinking. And, uh, and I remember one time he talked about uh, that when Jesus turned water into wine, it wasn't really wine, it was like grape juice, which is ridiculous to think about that. Otherwise, he would have said Jesus turned water into grape juice, right? And so, and I remember after one sermon, I was 15 years old, I said, Pastor Woodhouse, this just doesn't make any sense to me. And my parents didn't drink, and I wasn't really, I mean, I tried drinking beer, and I didn't like it, but I, you know, I didn't think much about it. But I said, it just doesn't make any sense that you're always preaching against this. And he said, well, um, when Jesus turned water into wine, it was really grape juice. I said, really? I mean, I, I just don't see that anywhere. He said, well, listen, Dwayne, just because Jesus did it doesn't mean that you need to do it. You know, two wrongs don't make a right. What kind of a weird theology is that, you know? In other words, he was trying to form his view 
and put it into Scripture. That's what a legalist always does. Legalism is an attitude, a mentality based on performance and pride. It is an obsessive conformity to an artificial standard for the purpose of exalting oneself, the Tower of Babel. Dan Taylor, uh, when I uh, was at Roseville Covenant Church in Minnesota, we were real close to Bethel Seminary, and Dan Taylor, he and I played basketball together. He's one of the professors. He was just a great, great guy. Has, has written some really neat books. But here's something he said, Dan Taylor. The great weapon of authoritarianism is legalism. The most damaging perversion of God's will and Christ's work is legalism that clings to the law at the expense of grace and to the letter in place of of the Spirit. If I do this or do that, I'll please God. If I could only do that, then I would be acceptable. So, uh, my grandfather, uh, my my paternal grandfather, Grandpa Cross, wonderful guy, uh, loved the Lord, uh, raised in a Southern Baptist church down south uh, when he was growing up. You know, when you're raised in a Southern Baptist church down south after church, you know, all the guys would immediately go outside and start smoking, right? Because most of them, you know, were, uh, you know, they, they were into that. And this is back in the 60s, 50s, and 60s. And that was, and they would also, you know, they used to love to swear. Now, you couldn't say, you know, GD, or you couldn't take God's name in vain. You couldn't say the mother of all swear words, but you could say everything else in between. And so after church, that's what they go and they would do. But my grandfather, when he believed something, he believed it with all his heart. And his main thing was the Sabbath, Keep the Sabbath holy. Now, I didn't like that because I wanted to watch football on Sabbath. But he defined it as you can't do any work, you can't do anything and go to church and just think about God. And he totally misunderstood the commandment. But I remember this one time, he had his pastor and wife come over to their house after church. We used to have Sunday night service that would go till like 7, 8 o'clock. And they'd come home and they would talk and visit. I couldn't eat anything because you couldn't, you know, work on Sabbath. You couldn't cook food on the Sabbath. You know, you had to just, you know, eat a piece of cold bread or something. So they wouldn't eat anything. And so, and the pastor said, well, I've got to go. No, no, don't go yet. Don't go. Finally, the clock struck midnight. And my grandpa said, let's go. We're going to White Castle and get some hamburgers. (laughs) Now, he wouldn't dare go to White Castle before because you were making somebody work on the Sabbath, right? See, this kind of convoluted way of thinking is what gets us all tied up. Religion always says no. Christianity always says yes. In 2 Corinthians, God's promises are what? Fulfilled in Christ, and they're said what? Sherry? Yes and amen. amen. (laughs) Every single time. Yes and amen. Jesus and his disciples in the grain fields in Mark chapter 2. Jesus made this idea very clear. So they're walking along, the disciples are hungry, they're in this grain field, and so some, it's on the Sabbath, some of the disciples start grabbing some grain and eating it. And uh, the Pharisees, I don't know where they were, but they popped up out of the weeds somewhere, and they said, aha, aha, you're working on the Sabbath. And, and Jesus said, are you guys kidding me? I mean, this happened in the old, te- and David, David uh, went out there and took some of the showbread from the temple and ate it because they were hungry. And this is what Jesus said in Mark two twenty seven: The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. Can that be any clearer, Jesus said? The Sabbath is a, is a day to do something different. It's a day to rest from your work. You love the Lord. You go to church, of course. You do wonderful things. You watch football. You do whatever, but you do something different. The thing is not the Sabbath. The thing is not what you do, but it's the Lord of the Sabbath that matters. Listen to these words in Galatians 3, 1 to 3. And Galatians, as you know, really is a, a wonderful book about freedom in Christ and liberty. Listen to Galatians 3, 1 to 3. Oh, foolish Galatians. So Paul's going to instruct them. Remember, Galatians and Colossians are very similar. They have parts of the text that are verbatim. Uh, This is a different section. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? What are you guys doing, he said. For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made clear to you as it was if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? It's ridiculous. Of course not. 
You received the Spirit because you believed in the message and you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? That is legalism. That is, I, I, I'm going to do this the right way so God will be okay with me. No. God's okay with you because Jesus is okay with you. And Jesus is okay with God. That's what makes us okay. Jesus plus anything, especially our human effort, is nothing. Good works, the law of Moses, astrology, observances, dancing, smoking, drinking, movies, cards, you are free, Paul says. Live like it. Live like it. It's not a what, it's a who. Now, let's talk about legalists for a moment. Legalists do three things. The first thing they do is they twist the truth to conform to their rigid doctrine. They twist the truth to conform to their rigid, log- their rigid uh, doctrine. So, 1968, I was a sophomore in college, and uh, I was the unpaid youth director in our church. They didn't have any money, so they tapped the college kid, you know, to be the youth director. So, I would teach the Sunday school class for the high school kids and stuff like that. So, 1968, remember that. Uh, Martin Luther King had been killed just a few years before. Uh, The Black Power Movement, uh, 1968 Olympics, right? So, a lot of the things we were experiencing in the 60s, we've experienced recently. Um, it, it, It grieves my heart that we still see our black brothers and sisters in a different way. I mean, after all of these years. But anyway, it was, it was very similar back then, and there was a lot of tension uh, among people. And I went to a big suburban high school, and uh, there were like four uh, African-American kids in our school of 2,000 students. And, um, and so I'm in college now, and there's this girl in our youth group who dates this African-American boy. And that caused a kerfluffle in our church, right? And I remember the mom coming up to me. I'm the youth director. Right? I'm supposed to straighten these kids out because you can't. You know, that's the whole idea of a youth director. And, uh, and, so, and so she comes up. She says, you've got to tell Susan she can't do this. And it's wrong. And it's ungodly. And the Bible says, be not unequally yoked. And she goes, and I said, well, time out, time out, time out, time out. What did you just say to me? The Bible says, be not unequally yoked. She can't marry a black kid. I said, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. It has nothing to do with the color of skin. In fact, they use that same argument, God forgive us, in the mid-19th century plantation owners. Same argument, okay? Be not unequally yoked. So this was just kind of a crazy, and we see this thing all the time, don't we? We twist the truth to conform to our rigid doctrines. Here's another thing legalists do. Legalists look for the petty do's and don'ts. The petty do's and don'ts. Now, some of you have heard this because I told it on one of my uh, Wednesday talks back when I was walking uh, the neighborhood. And, um, And so it happened when I was the youth pastor at Mount McGill Covenant Church. This was probably 1973. And uh, we've got a big youth group. We've got 100 kids, uh, high school kids. And uh, the deacons, dis- or the church decided they wanted the, k- the kids to come to Sunday night service, you know, which is like putting a gun to their heads. But uh, so uh, I, t- I told the kids, hey, guys, you know, the church, would you do this for me, right? I know it'll be boring, but after, after the Sunday night service, after 6 to 7, then we'll have our youth group meeting at 7 o'clock. And so God bless, about 50 of these kids came on a Sunday night. Now, there were 30 adults there because they were so spiritual, Right? but 50 high school kids. And this one old guy, Oscar Birch, severe black suit and tie, wing tips, the whole thing, you know. And these kids come in, and this is 1973, and these kids have long hair, and they're not wearing shoes, and they don't have the best behavior, and they're saying things that you shouldn't say in church, but they're in church, right? And they're there, and, they're, and Oscar comes up to me afterwards, and he scolds me. He says, you've got to get these kids straightened out. You've got to get them to wear the right kind of clothes and get their hair cut. And, you know, and I said, Oscar, Oscar, come on a Wednesday night. These kids are giving their hearts to Jesus every Wednesday night in our Bible study. These kids are being transformed by the power of the gospel. What are you 30 people doing up here? You're just telling everybody no, no, no. And so we had this conversation, and he wasn't happy with me. I wasn't happy with him. But here's the great part of the gospel. 
A week later, on a Sunday night, Oscar Birch shows up with a severe black suit, his severe black tie, and bare feet. God bless that 85-year-old man. He's now with the Lord, but God bless him because he, he started believing the gospel instead of how you look, how you dress, the color of your skin, or any other lame excuse. Legalists look for petty do's and don'ts, and the last thing legalism does, legalists do, it kills grace by hypocrisy. It kills grace by hypocrisy. You know the story in John. A woman was taken in adultery, she was put down by the law of Moses. She was to be stoned to death for her sin. Where was the guy in all this? We don't know. Guys got a pass. Girls didn't. And so they're going to stone this woman. And so all these Pharisees are standing around here with these stones. And these weren't uh, pebbles. These were rocks between a half pound and a pound. Okay? One of them would crush a skull. And they all had their rocks, and they're, you know how you do, just kind of tossing them like a baseball, just waiting. Who's going to be the first one? And, so, and Jesus comes into this group, and he says, hey, what's going on here? He says, well, this woman was taking adultery. According to the Mosaic law, we're going to kill her. We're going to throw stones at her. Jesus said, well, that's what the, Mos- the law of Moses says. How about this? Uh, the one who's going to cast the first stone is the one who doesn't have any sin. All the... Pharisees kind of took a step back, you know, like who's going to go first? See, Jesus saw into their hearts and saw the hypocritical nature. They wanted to crush this woman, but they had their own secret sins. Beware of the one who yells the loudest about your behavior. Beware of the one who is the most vocal about your bad behavior, or especially about the bad behavior of non-Christians. It's none of our business about the bad behavior of non-Christians, right? Beware of the hypocrite. He who was at without sin cast the first stone. Legalism, performanceism, shadows of the real thing. The real thing is Jesus and his amazing grace. Don't worship the what. Worship the who. And that word grace, we've heard, talked about this many times. That word grace means to bend, to stoop. It means condescending favor. It means unmerited blessing. Love that goes upward is worship. We've experienced that today. Love that goes outward is affection. We feel this way toward each other. But love that goes down, love that stoops, is grace. The February after our son was killed, February 1990, the Midwinter Conference was in Denver, and that's where we lived. And I went to the Midwinter Conference not because I was spiritual, but because I needed to get away from my family and especially from my amazing wife who cried herself to sleep every night. And as a coward, I just needed to get away from that. And so I went there and I stayed in my room the whole time. Meetings went on. My friend said, hey, come on, let's go play racquetball. No. Hey, let's go to a meeting. Let's go to a breakout session. Nope, 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 nope. Finally, one of my friends, Mick Murphy, came up to my room one night. He knocked on the door. I let him in. I was laying on the bed and he said, hey, let's go to a meeting tonight. No, I don't want to. And then Mick said something I'll never forget. He said, listen, I have prayed for you 100,000 times. But right now, I just need to pray over you. And he literally pulled me off of the bed onto my knees, put his hands on my head, and prayed for me. The grace of God is so powerful. I was still dealing with the idea of what did I do wrong? How did I not please God that he allowed this to happen to me? And yet this grace, as I stoop down, I receive that beautiful, gracious gift of the Heavenly Father. We see that in the story of the prodigal son, don't we? The prodigal son did all the wrong things. He moved away from his father. He spent all of his money. He came back with his tail between his legs, not wanting to be a son, but just to be a servant. And the father, the Bible says, saw him and came running out to greet him, embraced him. The text says literally he couldn't stop kissing his head. He put a robe on him, a ring on him. He killed the fatted calf. He had a party for him. And all of that because of his bad behavior? No. No because he was a son, because he was this father's child. And that grace was so, it's a beautiful picture of our heavenly father. But here's another picture in that same scenario. The eldest son. 
the eldest son said, Dad, it's not fair. I've stayed home. I've taken care of the fields. I've taken care of the crops. I've done everything you wanted me to do. And here's what the father said to the elder son. You are always with me. All I have is yours. That's what the elder son missed out on. The, the elder son thought that he had to do stuff. And his father said, no, no, no. Here's the key to everything I've been trying to teach you and the prodigal son. You are always with me. God's promises to you is that you are always, he is always with you. He is with you. He is with you. That's his message to you. Not can you perform correctly. Not can you believe correctly. Not can you do the right things. But he is with you and you are with him. That's grace. That's reality. Don't settle for the shadows. Don't settle, don't settle for being afraid of your, 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 your shadow like the little girl. The appearance of reality is not the real thing. The real thing is Christ and Christ alone. The real thing is hearing these words echo in your head. I am with you. Human effort, the shadow versus the reality of Jesus, appeared in a stark contrast 172 years ago. William Ernest Henley, the father of hum humanism, wrote a poem in Gloucester, England in 1949. Basically, it declared, we don't really need God. I mean, God's okay, but we don't really need him. It's kind of the cat theology, right? Uh, we are God enough. We are God enough. You'll hear it a few months from now if we have high school graduations in a few months. Um, but it's titled something you've heard before, Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell of clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. In other words, Jesus is not enough. You're enough. I wonder if your Jesus is big enough. The following year, a Christian author, a woman by the name of Dorothy Day, wrote a response entitled, My Captain. This is what she wrote. Out of the light that dazzles me, bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be for Christ, the conqueror of my soul. Since his the sway of circumstance, I would not wince nor cry aloud. Under that rule which men call chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. Beyond this place of sin and tears, that life with him and his the aid, despite the menace of the years, keeps and shall keep me unafraid. I have no fear, though straight the gate. He cleared from punishment the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. Jesus is enough. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we can so easily and so quickly determine our worth by how we behave or even by how well we believe. But the truth of your gospel is so beautiful. It is you as our Father coming running toward us while we're yet sinners. Come running toward us and holding us and kissing us on the head and wrapping us in a robe and putting a ring on our finger and I'm just saying, I, I, I just want to be with you. That's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reality of Jesus plus nothing equals everything. I just want to be with you. And Father, this morning as we receive this word, I pray that this word would echo in our hearts, in our heads, in our minds, in our souls, that you are with me. You are with me. 
no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the difficulties, no matter what the sin, as your child, as a child of the King, you are with me. Thank you, Father, for this truth. And Lord, it's got to be more than just understanding it. We've got to live it, for we have been set free by the power of the gospel to love and to be loved. And to that end, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.